G'day, I'm Gavin from Hurley's Fly Fishing. If fly fishing is something you want to get into, you want to do a course with us. We'll take you up to the new G and we'll teach you how to catch trout. $99, get in touch with us and we'll teach you how to be a superstar fly fisher. G'day, I'm Gavin from Hurley's Fly Fishing and welcome to our On The Fly Beginners DVD. What we're going to do in this uh, DVD is to, to show you the, the basics of fly casting. So you can watch the DVD and put those techniques into practice and you're going to be halfway there. And once you do it in your own time and you're relaxed about it, you'll realise it's not all that difficult. It's quite a simple process. Just put it into place, follow the procedures and you can have a lot of fun, be very successful doing it. We'll also show you how to catch some fish and the different techniques you're going to need to use to be successful on the water. Plus in the shop we'll show you some of the gear that you, you should be looking to get, give you a basic understanding of what's around and what's available, what you should be looking at to make sure that you have a lot of fun on the water. Now I hope you enjoy our DVD and look forward to catching up with you in our shop, on the water or on one of our TV shows on the fly. Now it's pretty important that you get things right from the start. The grip's very important. Uh, the, the fat part of the, uh, the cork, I like to have it right in the palm of my hand, and I like to steer things and get all the power from the thumb. That's a real driving force of the whole rod. Uh, some prefer with their lighter stuff to use their, their little finger, or there's a few others that like to even turn it uh, sideways. Whatever suits you and performs best is fine, but personally, I prefer the thumb. I also like to, to be side on when I'm casting. That's how you're gonna get a lot of your movement as you're casting as well, and a lot more of your rhythm. So get that right at the start and you're going to cast a lot more successfully. So the most important thing of the whole casting is the stopping. So we're going back, stop, forward, stop, and that really sets everything up for your release cast. Most important, that stop, all that power that you've put into the rod, once you stop, puts it into the line. That gets you all your distance, and really loads it up for your presentation to where the fish are. Very important, get that right, you're gonna be successful. You quite often hear about people talk between 10 and two. But that's where you want your rod to be going. We don't really want it going from nine till three because that gives you a much bigger arc and you just don't have all that power to shoot that line in one direction. So uh, we're getting back to there, just in those shorter little arcs with that pause in the middle, and that's how you're gonna get a really nice tight loop and a good directional cast. All right, so our back cast goes to there, stops, and then comes back down. And that's essentially all it is. We just need to go back, pause for a second, forward for a second, and straight back down. And that's gonna load the rod and shoot it out. What we're aiming for is very tight little uh, loops. And what that does, you can imagine if you're throwing a dart, it's going to go very straight line because you're pushing it forward with all the, the maximum force going that way. And when we're talking about loops, we're imagining something like that, a nice tight little loop. So that's where all that force is going to go in a nice little straight line. So we want very tight little loops and that's going to allow your fly line to get much further, much faster, particularly if there's a bit of wind around. Now a much bigger loop is something like that. You can imagine using a much bigger arc without any stops. Uh, and that's going to put force up, down, sideways, all around. And you're not going to get that real force and direction where you need to go. So get a much tighter loop with a nice little arc with that pause. And you're going to cast a lot better, a lot easier. Now putting that stop principle together, what we don't want to see is a constant movement. Uh, and that tends to happen when you're using too much wrist. So we don't want really big loops like that. Now one of the big problems we see with beginners is they use too much wrist at the start. What we also have, we have a casting aid, and that literally locks the, uh, the butt of the fly rod onto your, your wrist there and keeps it very stiff so you're not using too much wrist. So there's something you can buy, like little training wheels to get you started and get you using like the correct casting arc until you get the hang of it by yourself. So a cast is made up of two casts, a back cast, a pause, forward cast, pause, and literally lay your rod down. And that's going to cast 20, 30 feet. And that's where you're going to catch a lot of your fish. So you don't always need to be casting 70, 80 feet, 
you're going to catch a lot of fish, even literally at a couple of rod lengths away. So if you can get this right to start with, you're going to be successful. Back cast, forward cast, and just come down with the line. And that's going to give you a really good presentation to deceive these fish. So once you've got the back cast, forward cast down pat, what we also have is what we call a false cast. And that's literally just keeping the line up in the air. So we'll do that for a couple of reasons. The same technique, get to that one, one false cast and just come down with it. That can do a few things. If you've got a dry fly, a couple of casts like that's gonna dry it out and put it back on the water and float really well. You can also use that to gain a little bit of extra distance. As you go, you can let out a little bit more line and that can give you like a greater distance to cast a lot further. So shooting line is how we get all our distance. And it doesn't mean that you have a lot of line aerialized all at once. It's just at the end, when you've got a little bit of line out, you allow that line to literally pull all the spare line that you've got. Much the same as if you had a lure or a sinker on a normal spinning rod, you would cast it and that would pull the line out. The same with a fly rod because all we're casting is actually the line itself. And when it comes to shooting line, it's gotta be the last thing you do is let that line go. So we need that rod to be loaded and then stopped, and then you let that line go. So we just false cast, get to there, and then let that pull all that line out, and that's how you're gonna get all your distance. Now presentation is a term that we use a lot in fly fishing. What it uh, involves too, this fly line is going to go exactly where I stop this tip. So if I'm going right up in the air, that's where the line's going to go. If I'm coming all the way down, that's where the line's going to go. If it's too low, it's going to splat on the water. If it's too high, it's just going to fade you know, with the wind on its way down. So what we need is somewhere in the middle where that line is going to straighten out, lose all its energy, and you can imagine like a a, a tiny little beetle or something like that is literally going to flutter down and that's the presentation that we want with it with a fly so all that involves is literally going to a place in about the middle where it allows the line to straighten out and then just flutter down without any energy and that's going to literally put that fly as naturally on the water to a fish as can be so aiming too high the line's literally going to come down in a bit of a puddle on itself if we aim too low the line is literally going to splat on the water and literally frighten the fish. So we need somewhere in the middle. Straighten out about eye level, lose all its energy and just flutter back down. Now another cast that we use a lot, particularly in the river systems, is a roll cast. You can imagine if we had big trees or, or a cliff behind us, we can't get a back cast because you're going to just get tangled up. So what we do is we use the water to load the rod and put a bend in it and literally just shoot it forward as a normal cast. If you can imagine our fly line becomes the, uh, the, the um, half circle of a D and the rod is your straight section. What we want to do is to get that, the, um, the water to load the rod. You can imagine there's the D, pause and literally go into a forward cast. And that's going to shoot that fly line out to where the fish are without needing a back cast. So if you need to cast on the other side, just tilt the rod on that side and turn that over. So you can literally cast on either side here, depending on which side of the river the fish are. Now another cast very similar to that, if you've got something behind you uh, that you can't get a normal back cast, which is perhaps level, it's called a steeple cast. And when we speak about like the 10 and 2, we've literally got to alter that. So, you know, it might be nine, you know, and, and 12 o'clock. You've got to throw that line up high above whatever's, you know, your obstruction there. And that's pretty simple. You just throw it up high and then down low. So you're throwing it up and then down low. So you still can get that presentation out in front of you without getting hooked up behind you. That's called a steeple cast. Throw it up high and then down low. Sometimes as well you might be fishing in a river system that has quite a few currents. So what we need to do is put some slack into the line itself as it drifts back towards you. A good way of doing that is called a wiggle cast. 
So we literally, a normal cast, but as it's in the air, you literally wiggle the rod. And that puts a whole lot of uh, wiggle through the line. So as it drifts back towards you, you're not going to get any drag and it's going to be a great presentation. Uh, now another type of cast you can imagine if you're on a river uh, and you've got maybe some overhanging trees you can't do an up and down cast because you're not going to get under them and trout and any fish for that matter will sit under them because a lot of uh, beetles and bugs are going to fall in at various times so what we need to do is get our fly right in amongst those trees so what we need to do is literally just turn our rod to the side um, and just cast underneath and that's going to put the uh, the fly line literally level with the water and you can get right down low to where the fish are going to be looking for their food to come from. So for that low cast, perfect. Everything just stays the same. You're still using the same arcs, the same paws. You're just turning that rod on the side. There'll be different times of a river you need to be casting to different sides. You've got a couple of options. You can either learn to cast right-handed and left, which a lot of really good anglers do, or you can simply just turn the rod on either side. So as a right-hander, I'm normally over my right side, but I can also just literally throw it over my left shoulder and get a completely different angle to it. So uh, that can really open up a river to be casting on both sides. Now there'll be times on a river where you're going to have some obstructions behind you that you really need to keep an eye on, which is pretty difficult when you've got a fish rising in front of you. So what you need to do is literally be watching your cast behind you more than in front of you. So you're literally going backwards and forwards, watching where your line is, so it's not going to get tangled, and then casting forward to where you know the fish is. The alternative too is to literally turn around and cast backwards. And once you get there, you know exactly that your line is not going to hook up to a tree or anything like that. And then literally just throw it over your shoulder to where the fish is. And turn around, get him to take it, hook it, and you're a champion. Now when we're using one fly, we can get a very uh, tight loop, which is very good for distance and accuracy. Once you use two flies, which is something that you will use a lot once you get the, the hang of the, the casting and stuff, and quite often you might have a, a dry with a nymph dropper or even like two nymphs. But very important, you need to open up your arc a little bit more to allow both flies to straighten out before you're going forward. And that's simply a matter of just pausing a little bit longer and using a little bit more wrist once you get the hang of it. So it just opens it up, gives you a slightly bigger loop and just allows those two flies to both roll out and turn over without tangling. When you're fishing a river or a lake, uh, the line's going to sit on the water and be hard to pull up, particularly when you've got a big line on. What we like to do, and it's a very subtle way of getting that fly line off the water, is give it a wiggle, and that pulls that line off the surface, lets uh, the tension go, it makes it much easier to lift off. So uh, you've got a big line out, give it a bit of a wiggle before you pull it up, and you're ready to go again. Particularly important if you're chasing smelting fish, we have got a quick cast in, in different areas. It's a great way to get your fly out there much, much faster. If you come across a few problems when you're out fishing yourself, one of them will be that the line's all coming down on itself. And that will be because you're not stopping the rod. You're coming all the way down and it literally, that line's gonna go where you stop that rod tip. So if you bring it all the way down near the water, that's gonna pull all the line straight down and it'll land in a puddle and not turn over. So if you find yourself doing that, bringing it down, just make sure, remember that stop. You get that right, that'll fix everything. So to get there, stop, that'll allow it to turn over and present much, much better. Now another problem that beginners have is they use too much wrist at the start and a continuous movement without the stop. So if you just find you're using really big arcs, you're getting much um, bigger loops and you're not going to get any distance and it's going to land in a puddle and not really go anywhere. 
So just remember, either use that training aid that we have for your casting, or just try and lock that wrist in a, a little bit firmer and put that power into the rod and it's going to transfer to the line. So uh, there's always going to be things, you're not going to pick it up straight away with everything, but just persist or come into you know, our shop and we can sort of help you out as well and uh, point you in the right direction. Because once you get the hang of this fly rod, you're going to catch a lot more fish and have a real lot of fun. Now we're going to start off with a dry fly. Now that can imitate uh, perhaps a nymph that swam to the surface, hatched out and turned into a dun or a mayfly. Um, it could be like something that's jumped in from, from the land, whether it be a grasshopper, a cricket or a moss or something like that. And it, essentially something that's just going to float. This will essentially absorb water over time. So what we do is we put on a silicon, uh, a floatant, and that literally coats it and scotch guards it for want of a better word and just makes it float for a lot longer. Uh, and what we'll do, as you can imagine with a little fly like this, We've got to put movement into that that would happen naturally. So with a tiny little mayfly, that would actually just float with the current. If it was a grasshopper, it might kick its legs a little bit. But you want to impose about the same sort of movement as would naturally. The trout are going to be facing upstream. So we're going to cast that fly upstream and that's going to drift back towards where the fish is. And a couple of things to remember once we do that. It's called line management, and this is very important. It's all well and good having great casting and all that sort of stuff, but once that fly hits the water, that's when the real action starts, and it's imperative that you do things properly. So what we need to do, if a fish takes that, if you're using a worm, for example, he put it in his mouth and he'll realise that's food, and he'll eat it. With a fly, he'll realise pretty quickly that that's a bit of metal and fur and feather, and he's not going to eat it, and he'll spit that back out. So what we need to do is set the hook pretty well straight away. So as soon as that goes in that fish's mouth, we've got to lift the rod, not like a big snapper strike, but literally just lift it, maybe your foot, until that line's tight, and that will set the hook, and you're ready to play that fish. All right, now when we cast out, upstream, and that's going to drift back towards us. Now, over, depends on how fast the water's going, but very quickly, that line is going to bunch up right down at the end of my rod tip. So if a fish is to take that now, I can... I've got to lift before I'm even moving the flight. All that sort of distance before that set the hook. And that, for a trout, is enough time for it to spit it. So what we, we need, it's called line management. And I've got to get that line inside of these guides before uh, the fish takes that fly. So it's simply a matter of casting out. You want the rod tip right low by the water. And any slack build up, you're going to pull that in through your fingers here. So as soon as that fish takes, you lift that rod like maybe a foot and you've set the hook already. So uh, just pays to be ready when that fish does take. Good. That's good when a plan comes together and that fish likes it. He's a, oh, that's got a bit of power in that. There's a lot of rocks and everything over that side. Got to try and, uh, he was a bit surprised when there was a hook in that done. We could be in a little bit of strife there if he goes, and I can't turn him from that. So we, all we've got to do is hold that rod up high and try and avoid some of these rocks. And we're in a little bit of strife downstream. And here we go. <laughs> it's got a bit of power. I'll just try and get him out of this main current. Good fish, good bit of go in it. We can keep him out of that current and we're all right. Nice big head on him too, he's, uh, he's good. Make sure he's in the net. And then we're all set, four and a quarter. No wonder a bit of grief. Once they get in that fast current, there's not much you can do. You've just got to go with them. You can just see, that's a typical no brown. What we'd normally do, you've probably seen uh, as well on a few of our other shows, where we'll put things into a grid system. So uh, we would look at a certain area and, and perhaps start it over there and let it drift down through one little area. And if, if that doesn't 
hold a fish that's come up to strike, we might cast another foot to the right, to the right, to the right, and just work your way along so you're covering all sections of the river. And then you might take another couple of metres further upstream and then cast again. So you're really putting your fly over all parts of the river and giving every fish that's there a chance to eat your fly. Now another thing I want to show you too is, is what we'll call drag. And that's if your fly is moving faster than the actual current, it will actually drag along the top. And uh, an interesting way to see it is you'll have what we call a V behind your fly. And that's literally um, where it, it is skating across the top of the surface and is very unnatural and a fish won't eat it. Generally the cause of that is if you have like lots of uh, big currents or if your fly line gets below your rod. So you can see if that all builds up and the current pushes the line and that will essentially drag that fly much faster than the current. And you, you get essentially it will either drag it under or get that V behind it. Trout are very cautious and they know when something's wrong, they know to be frightened. So if you, they do get a V like that, that's, they're not going to eat it. You're going to frighten it. An easier way of doing it, if you are coming across there like that, it's called a mend. So what we can do is throw the line back up above the rod. And then you can just drag in that slack and that will give that a much more natural drift. And to the fish anyway, give you more chance to come up and eat that. Oh yeah, that's a nice fish. And you could just look up next to that log, you could see a lovely bit of water. And um, yeah, he took that like he had all day to take it. It's a lovely little rainbow. And he's a lovely, uh, a lovely fish. The beauty of that dry, uh, they rarely refuse it. So um, yeah, you'll hear me talk about it a, a bit. A uh, royal rubber leg stimulator. And it certainly works on the Stevie. You know, we're just going to fish a nymph, so that's a beaded nymph uh, with a little gold bead head. When the water's a bit discoloured or early in the season, I like to use a gold bead to make it sink and give a little bit of flash. Later on in the year or when the rivers are very clear, I'd go to a black bead, perhaps even a tungsten. Now, you can put this to any depth that you want this fly to go. I'll just go a couple of feet. Uh, and I'm going to put on here just a little stick-on indicator. Very basic, very easy to use indicator. It indicates to us when a fish takes this fly or if you can imagine even if you were bait fishing, it's almost like a little float. So when that goes sideways or down or, or just stops, it's because a fish has got that in his mouth and then you strike, set the hook and away you go. So uh, you fish it the same way as you would a dry. We're casting that upstream, letting it drift naturally. As you can imagine, that's not gonna be able to, uh, an animal of that size not swim very strongly. So it'll go with the current and wait for a fish to put that in his mouth and then we'll hook him. Same principle applies, let that float down. I want that to be very natural. And as soon as that moves, you've got to set the hook very quickly with the, uh, once they take nymphs. Because there's a delayed reaction between that indicator going down and you reacting as well. So uh, well, I, don't, I don't think you could ever be too, too fast when you strike with a, uh, a nymph and an indicator. And just a nice little fish there and that's what it's about you're just throwing that up upstream letting that drift back towards you and just wait for any movement on that uh, indicator and uh, it's an amazingly effective way to fish like trout will probably eat about 80 90 percent under the surface so they're always going to be, be feeding and uh, it just makes good reason to put what they're going to be eating on most of the time in front of them and that's worked it's just a nice little nice little rainbow and uh, be a good couple of pounds, but just great fun. And in a place like this, it's really good practice for you as well. So, um, I mean, I'm not asking you to come here if you've been fishing for 25 years, but a good place to practice catching fish and putting the techniques that you're learning and perfecting on the rivers into practice here. You'd be surprised at how good you get at catching these trout. And we talk about netting a lot too, and it's uh, you literally just got to tie that fish out, and we want his head to be up out of the water, and they lose. Uh, a lot of their power, obviously, if there's heads out and uh, lead him to the net and lift him in there. A nice little rainbow, 
and just good fun to catch. And that nymph just works a treat. That's a lovely little fish. You can imagine in the Goulburn or the Rubicon, perfect size. And uh, yeah, just don't get tired of catching uh, any fish on a fly is good. There. Well, uh, back eddy there where a tree's fallen in the water and just off that main current and that's always worth a cast and um, that's good when you always got to have a plan and when it works out that that uh, yeah makes a lot more fun and uh, he's taken the nymph even though there's plenty of uh, insects about the, that dry and a nymph cocktail is just a brilliant way to go and uh, it just doubles your chances and he's a nice little brown, so this you know, just half a pound, but on that lightweight gear is just great fun. And uh, beautiful red spots, just characteristic, just a wonderful fish to target in, in terrific surroundings, and he's good to go. Now we've seen a, a dry fly, which is a, a very visual way to do, and I think one of everybody's favourites, uh, a nymph under an indicator, which is very successful. Another way to fish a nymph is without an indicator and literally in a river system you might cast down and across and let the current do the work or in a lake virtually just out and just cover the water but you need to maintain contact with it to know when a fish has got it. A couple of ways of doing that either just short tiny little strips you can imagine a nymph would just do in little darty movements or what they call a figure eight retrieve and as you can imagine it's just pulling the line through the fingers in there and that literally puts the line in the figure eight can just drop that or use that to cast but essentially all you're doing is just maintaining contact so when that fish takes you can set the hook straight away another thing to remember too is we always drag that line through our top fingers so that if the fish takes at any stage we can just tighten up here on the, um, the grip on the rod and then we've got a tight line and then we can lift the rod and set the hook and he's got no chance of getting away Sometimes, oh, good aerial little fish, and they're just good fun. I mean, they're uh, just a couple of pound. But we always say when you are stripping line in, you've got to maintain a bend on that rod, and that uh, certainly makes him fight against the rod before he's fighting against your tippet. If you get him on a straight pull, he's got a lot of things in his favour. So get that bend in the rod and make him work hard against your rod. With smaller fish like this, or in a lake, it doesn't really matter. I will always strip the line just through my fingers. Uh, but if you're in, say, New Zealand or something like that, that's when you really need all this slack line to be not dragging around your feet or on rocks. So you want that wound up, ready to you know, chase him downstream and things like that. But it's really a great way to pick up a fish fishing uh, a nymph without an indicator. You cover a lot of water and it's a very successful way of uh, fishing and uh, some pretty good rewards with it too. We'll just get him back and good to go. So what we've got to finish off with um, as part of our, 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 our trout system is what we call a streamer. Uh, and that will imitate to a fish anyway, a, perhaps a, a yabby or a mud eye or a little minnow, just something quite big and large and getting away. So um, you can imagine like the darting motion that uh, perhaps a mud eye would have. So we'll cast that out, let that sink a little bit, and we're doing it in 10 to 15 centimetre strips. And you can imagine pull, pull, and then pause, pull, pull, and that just has a, uh, imparts a lot of action on quite a big fly and that will attract fish you know from a considerable distance away because it's worth the effort you know, because it's such a sizable uh, uh, bit of food for them. So we let that sink and you have different retrieve methods sometimes they need something much faster and that really excites them um, and takes away a lot of their choice. We want them to react to it rather than have to think about it so uh, you just vary your retrieve and also your casting area. You don't want to be casting it to exactly the same spot each time. So you would normally, as we talk about a fan, and you would cover as much area as you can until you actually see a fish. You might go out and see a rising fish and cast to it straight away. Uh, but if there's nothing moving, it doesn't actually mean there's no fish there. It just means that you can't see them because they're not feeding near the surface. So get that. 
Now a woolly bugger or a smelt fly is going to be a fly that moves a lot of water and creates a bit of disturbance. So the way you fish it is, is cast perhaps 45 degrees down and just you can almost let the, the river do the work. So that's swinging at the moment, that will come up and down. So what we'll do with this woolly bugger, we'll throw it downstream, let that swing. You want to maintain contact. The fish is virtually going to hook himself, so you're doing little strips and that'll just get it to, to jump around and, and the fish will see it's getting out of its uh, grasp and it, he'll jump onto it. And just a matter of putting it in front of a fish. Oh, there. Finally, I knew it'd work eventually. There's, uh, I've had a couple of little taps we had earlier and uh, you can just feel that tap and then it's good to lift the rod and there's a fish on the end of it. A, a black beadhead woolly bugger and swinging it in that and coax him into the, sh the sh slower water here. Might be a lot easier to, to play. He hasn't come up yet. Oh, come on, mate. Head first. Beautiful. There you go. So that's what happens when you fish a woolly bugger and put it in front of a, uh, a lovely rainbow. We get four and a quarter at the butchers, so that's pretty good. That's on the McLean's um, lie detector, so that tells the truth. Just in beautiful nick, and that's what you come to New Zealand for, a fish like that. And there's one's way over 10 pound in here, which this one will get to eventually. Now, if there was one word that I could give you which is going to help you a lot, it's the word pause. And whether it is in the casting, we, we talk about that. You go back cast and then pause, forward cast and then pause. Just fixes a lot of things. But I think it's also quite important when you go onto a river or a lake or, or an estuary, wherever you're going to go, and once you get there, just stop. So don't just jump out and go willy-nilly and start casting everywhere. Before you hit the water, just stop and have a look around. You know, and you're looking for fish that might be feeding or under the surface or making a bow wave. You get a real good indication of what's going on and then you can decide what you're going to do. What fly you're going to tie on and all that. You don't want to make your mind up on the, on the drive to the water on what fly you're going to use and how you're going to fish it. Wait until you get there. A lot of things can um, be different to what you expect and you've got to be ready to change. So you might get there and the water's a bit dirty. Well, you know, you can, you can put a, a different fly. You might use a woolly bugger or something to create a bit of water movement and, and excite the fish to take. If it's a beautiful day and there's a great insect hatch, well, then you're going to be on dry flies. If there's not, we'll tie on a nymph and an indicator and we'll get the flies down to where the fish are because the fish are always going to be feeding. Just because we can't see them on the surface, you know, and everyone loves dry fly and it's beautiful, but they're like Labradors, they will eat non-stop. So just, if they're not there, they're going to be perhaps taking nymphs down the bottom or, you know, chasing some smelt around and they just uh, subsurface. But we target our flies um, to whatever they're likely to be eating. So just stop, pause, have a look around, and then make your decisions on how you're going to attack these fish. It just helps, little things like that, it just helps you be a lot more successful. So uh, take your time and you get a, a lot more fun out of it. Now when it comes to fly rods, it can be pretty daunting. Uh, there's that many models and brands and weights and yeah, and there's a little bit of garbage that goes on about all of them. But essentially, most fly rods are all pretty good nowadays. I think your best bet is to come into a shop and then ask somebody behind the counter who does it for a living and say, this is what I want to do, this is where I want to go, this is how much I want to spend, what do you reckon? And most good fly shops will have an area where you can go out and cast. So we're not asking you to, to make a decision based on that. You need to go out and cast it. And everyone has their own individual actions and what sort of suits them. And they're literally like Harry Potter's wand, you know, a fly rod will pick its owner. And that's what it's really like. You'll just pick up a rod and just cast and it just suits. And that's what it's all about. Try something first and you're going to have a much better idea. But initially, you want to know where you're going to fish. If you're going to fish mainly small little streams, then you need a lighter rod, whether it be perhaps a four weight or even a two weight. If you're going to fish big rivers or go to um, New Zealand or Tassie and do a lot of lakes and that, well, you're going to need a nine foot six weight. You know? And they are a little bit, fortunately or unfortunately, they're a little bit like golf clubs. So um, there you will be a specific rod with a line weight to suit different areas that you're gonna fish. So down the track, you might find yourself owning three or four, or uh, you could even own a few more than that, but uh, different rods, 
because they're going to be suited to different purposes. But uh, come down and speak to the guy behind the counter. He's going to have an understanding of what you want to achieve and how you're going to do it, and he'll help you and point you in the right direction. Now, when it comes to fly reels, there is a massive selection out there. But to break it down, um, you can spend a fortune and uh, you can spend a couple of bob and still get something okay. The fly reel, I think, is still the least important thing about the whole shooting match. But it's just nice to have a really nice reel that just works whenever you need it to do. I guess the, the main differences are you go from die cast, which is um, you know, empty VB cans melted down and poured into like a, a reel. Uh, and they're much cheaper to produce. Uh, but overall, they're still quite good. They're in what we call a large arbor. So if you can see in there, that's all filled in um, so that the reel is wound up in much bigger loops and it doesn't have that little pigtail memory into the fly line as well. So that's a, that's a really good reel um, and it'll do everything you need to do and they're like $70, so you don't need to spend a lot. I guess then it jumps up to your imported from, from Asia, uh, a machine. So that's one block of uh, 6061 uh, aircraft aluminium and it's ground down. So that's where you get a lot of the strength from that. So that makes it a much, much stronger reel, particularly if you're knocking it and things like that or falling over. This won't bend, whereas a, a die cast will. It doesn't have that strength in that. Also, you tend to get like a better drag system in, in a lot of your, your machine reels as well. Slightly more expensive, you jump up to about $150. Reel, uh, up to what are literally the best in the world, the Galvin reels, which are made in America, lifetime guarantee, and are literally indestructible. They've got um, you know, a drag system that you could stop a, uh, a train, literally. Uh, and they're probably your best in the world. So up. for a reel that's gonna last a lifetime, uh, if you can get something like that, Galvin's, because that's all I use, because they're the best in the world. Now when it comes to fly lines, we are spoiled for choice. There's literally you know, a million different good quality lines out there. It goes from like the top of the, the range scientific angler in the shark wave, uh, the Rio Grande uh, perceptions, a lot of great lines in that, uh, to air flows, and there's a lot of specific lines for a specific purpose. And that's a lot of information for you to have to decipher. What's probably best is you come into the shop and say, this is what I want to do, this is you know, the fish I'm going to be targeting, and we'll be able to find one that's going to suit you. What I will say though is I tend to use a weight forward. You know, Double taper is a thing of the past. Nobody buys double tapers anymore. You buy a weight forward line and in a nice dull colour. If we were fishing for hatchery fish, we could use a bright orange, uh, things that, you know, because they don't know to be frightened, you know, like a wary sort of uh, stream fish. I use a dull colour and that will blend in, once that lands on the water, to a fish anyway, that could just look like a stick or you know, a, a bit of bark falling off. It's not really a frightening colour. If you start to get into a lot of the, these sort of bright sort of colours like, like that, you're going to find that that's so unnatural and it just alerts the fish that something could be wrong. And that's what we don't want to do. We want the, him to see the fly as the only thing he sees and not bring the attention to anything else. So come into the shop and we can run through all the attributes that they, all these lines have got and pick out one that's going to suit you. But uh, buy the line because next to the rod, that's the most important thing and they're going to last a long time and put your fly to where it needs to be. And when it comes to leaders and tippets, it can be a little bit daunting. There's 12 foot, 9 foot, 3x, 7x, 9x. Don't get too worried about it. I think there's reasons to have a really long leader and long tippet and all that, but the longer it is, the less control you're going to have. So right at the start, let's keep it quite basic and quite short. So let's start off with a nine foot leader. I'd probably go, for example, a nine foot in uh, a three X. And three X is around about eight pound. What we want to do is start off thick and go to thin. And that helps with its turnover. And also the weakest point is going to be nearer the fly. So if we do an eight pound leader in a nine footer, and we put on four X tippet, which is around about six pound. That's going to do most of your fishing. And most of your fish are not going to be able to break that. So if we start with that sort of system, down the track, we can look to have, you know, perhaps going lighter, maybe, you know, even, even a four pound tippet on your smaller streams, uh, or the use of fluorocarbon as opposed to mono, if we want to sink under the surface, or perhaps even using nymphs to get down. But initially, we've got a lot to think about at the start anyway. Let's keep it basic. We use quite a heavy leader and then make the tip a little bit um, lighter than that. And we're going to be on the right track. Now, when it comes to waders, there's quite a few options. I guess we all started with like PVC type waders, uh, you know, with the gum boot attached. And they're okay as well. And a good um, entry level price point. 
once you've sort of been doing the fly fishing for a little while, you will build up to some unbreathable waders. Uh, what you want to do, they, they'll come in a range of either, say, like your, your chest or even in a, um, in a waist model, which is sort of handy if you're not wading too deep, or even into um, some thigh waders as well if you're just around lake edges. So there's certainly uh, a range of, of waders to suit your needs. They do come with a stocking foot as well and it's very comfy and it lasts a long time. So you, you put on a good pair of uh, solid wading boots and you're gonna be right for some, some really good fishing because you tend to do a lot of walking. What you wanna be looking for in your waders is to have um, like double protection below the knee. That's your drama area. And it's not a bulletproof material. It's made to be lightweight and breathable. You don't get hot and sweaty. But this extra layer below the knee certainly protects against, you know, sticks and rocks and, and, and blackberry bushes and things like that. Uh, a good safety wading belt is very important. So if you do go into the drink, you're not going to fill up with water. Uh, and some good straps and uh, quite often now, a lot of them will have like hand warmers. So um, it keep you quite warm and comfortable. Uh, and a decent set of waders is going to be something that's going to last quite a long time and allow you to catch a lot more fish. Now on the end of the, the waders we need a decent set of wading boots. There's quite a few different models around. What we're really looking for is a good rubber sole. This is a Vibram sole which is nice and aggressive and gives you really good grip on slimy rocks. Um, there's various models there that you can also attach studs to which gives you a little bit of extra bite if there's a little bit of moss you know, or wet grass and things like that as well. All the way up to their guide series which is a, a very high quality boot um, that's going to take a lot of knocks and abrasions and really look after your feet. Because at the end of the day you're going to do a lot of walking and if your feet are not barking you're having a lot more fun. Now there's a lot of accessories that you can get into with fly fishing. From little things like booties, if you're going to wet wade perhaps either when it's, it's really hot in Australia or perhaps in New Zealand where there's not as many snakes, um, to a range of different things from, from uh, wading staffs which can give you a little bit more stability uh, in some of these larger rivers and they fold up nice and uh, easily that you can fit on your, your wading belt so they're not too cumbersome. Uh, now when it uh, comes to wet weather gear, it's very important that you buy some good stuff. Something like the uh, Stalker uh, three layer wading jacket is ideal. It's very light, you don't get hot and sweaty in it. A lot of features through it where we've got like cuffs that's tighten up around your, your wrist. So as you're waving that fly rod around, uh, water doesn't trickle down and give you a wet arm. Uh, nice hand warmer pockets, big pockets for big fly boxes, water resistant zips, uh, you know, and a couple of little, little zingers in there that you can put, um, you know, some forceps or clippers and things like that. It's also some of the, the, the better ones will have, like in the back there, a little, a little zippered pocket to put a drink or your lunch and things like that. So uh, buy something that's going to keep you dry and warm and breathable as well. And you're going to have a lot of fun out on the water, even if it is pouring with rain. And when it comes to nets, I think they're very important because it allows you to get the fish before he's literally buggered and before he can do any harm to himself, like I'm bashing around on the rocks and things like that. So I love to use a net. You go from a traditional style like these lovely timber nets made in Australia by John Bradley. They're a fantastic thing to have. Or what I tend to use a lot of lately is the McLean's net, which are a New Zealand net. Um, and they come in a few different ranges of, of knotless mesh to a rubberized coating, nice on the fish. But the biggest plus is they have scales on the bottom. So uh, I call it a lie detector. So when you need to know how much that fish weighs, the McLean's net will tell you. Now I'm going to make these flies very simple. If we started off with a nymph, something that lives, say, under rocks for a couple of years until it swims to the surface and hatches to a flying insect, that, a wet fly like that will look much thinner and not have much hackle around it. And that will essentially sink. Then it goes to a dry fly, and that could be a flying insect, so something that just floats on the water. Uh, that could be a nymph that's hatched into to that for it to, to fly away, or it could even be a grasshopper or a cricket, something that's fallen into the water. And then we've also got something that imitates perhaps a yabby or a mud eye, uh, and that's a wet or a streamer fly. So essentially that's your three types of flies for fresh water, and there's plenty of variances in between, but that's basically your three different types of flies. Now when it comes to selecting flies, it can be a little bit daunting. You come into a shop like this and there's you know, 300 different ones and different sizes. Don't be too intimidated. You can just ask for help and just say, this is where I'm going to be fishing. This is what I want to catch. What do you think I should use? And you will pick it up 
you know, the more you do and the more you learn. So uh, don't be afraid to ask and don't be too, too worried about not knowing the answers to everything. But if, if it comes down to, I think presentation is very important rather than just a particular fly, but at certain times the fly is very important. But if I had six flies that I would use to save my life virtually anywhere in the world, I would use an Adams parachute in a 16. That's going to cover almost all your, your mayflies, which is one of the dominant uh, trout food species. We also have like a blowfly, which works as you would have seen on quite a few of our shows in New Zealand, and it's, it's almost cheating, it's that good. Uh, in Australia, I'd perhaps swap that to um, a red humpy or something like that. A rubber-legged um, royal stimulator is amazing on all of our rivers that have perhaps caddis or grasshoppers. Um, Hubert's red, you all know how often I tie that on because it just imitates the spent uh, mayfly just incredibly and the fish just keep eating it. Um, Hubert's Bismarck is another little um, tungsten nymph that I use in the 16 quite often. And then if I'm searching, I use the, um, the green magoo, which is just a magnificent fly that just works you know, throughout all our lakes, both in, in Australia, New Zealand, literally all around the world. So. Uh, Obviously there's reasons to have one of every fly, but initially just keep it quite simple. Don't worry about um, you know, overthinking things. Just put a nice little fly on, cast it into the fish's mouth and everything will just work out fine. Now fly tying is something you want to get into. There's various kits that you can buy that will hold a lot of the different gear to get you started. Uh, it helps to perhaps even join a club or something like that or do a course where you can learn how to tie flies. And once you get the, um, the initial techniques right, all the flies are tied almost the same. So um, spend a bit of time and you get a lot of enjoyment out of tying a fly yourself casting it to a fish and getting him to take something that you've made up yourself. So um, spend a bit of time, learn how to do it. Pick out, there's quite a range of different vices that you can get as well. So pick out one that's going to suit you uh, and your budget and you'll uh, get a lot of enjoyment on those days when you can't spend it fishing. Now a couple of things what you're going to use all the time uh, are very important. One is floatant, which is fly sauce. Uh, I use that because I find that's the best. And what you need to do is put that onto your dry flies before they get wet. Uh, that'll keep them floating nice and high, uh, much easier to see and easier to detect takes. Once the fly does get wet by either catching a few fish or it slowly just absorbs water over time, we put it into a product called Shake and Float, and that's a desiccant that you put the fly in, give it a shake, that um, absorbs all the water, completely dries it out, then reapply the floatant. And just keeps those flies um, right up high on, on the water and uh, working much better for you. Now there is literally a million accessories that you can use throughout fly fishing. Initially though, just take your time and, and find a use for, for what you need and then buy it. So don't overload everything uh, too much at the start. Uh, what you will need though, and what I use all the time, is a tie fast combo knot tie. And that's got clippers and also the tool to tie the nail knot, which is quite a difficult knot. But with this tool, it just makes it so much easier. So that's something you will use all the time. Uh, I also use the catch and release uh, tool which gets the fly out of the fish very quickly and easily uh, with less um, harm to the fish. That's an amazing tool to, to use. And I also use for my indicator fishing, um, if using nymphs and things like that, quite down deep, from the Strike Indicator Company in New Zealand. And they make an adjustable system to, um, to move your indicators. And I'll use that from, with nymphs or, or the, the new bead systems and things like that. So it's a great tool. So they're the three that I would use all the time. And then as you go, you'll find different um, reasons to have um, different other accessories as well that improves your fishing because at the end of the day, that's what it's all about having a great time on the water and enjoying yourself. Now when you're fly fishing, you're always on the move, so you've got to carry everything that you're going to need. Fly vests are a very traditional way of doing that, um, and they have lots of pockets that you can fill up with literally everything. Big pockets as well for your fly boxes, and there's a few different designs and price points as well. What I tend to use myself is, I tend to use one of these um, uh, packs, and there, what I find is a little bit lighter as well, 
a lot more aerated, don't get anywhere near as hot, and uh, you've got all the things you need, you know, some big fly boxes, little zingers, fold down little bits and pieces, and you can also attach a lot of these, they're interchangeable with a much larger backpack. So if I'm perhaps guiding or something like that, or, or I'm away all day and I might need lunch and a drink and uh, a raincoat, all the business there, you can fit it in that. Or if I'm just going for short little, you know, after, you know, perhaps a couple of hours, I can just wear the light little back. So there's a few different ones. Find out what, you know, is going to suit you and what's more comfortable. Try them all on and then make a decision because they're going to last a long time and give you a lot of fun wearing them. Now with trout fishing in particular, colour plays an important role. I'm sure uh, trout are very spooky at the best of times, but if there's something waving around uh, a little bit more, it's going to frighten them. What you want to do is tend to blend in a little bit. So you might find, say, in the middle of summer, you'd wear like a nice light shirt like that because it's going to blend into you know, all the, um, the faded grass and things like that. If you're going to be around more bush uh, lined areas you might go in a little bit darker or maybe in the middle of winter you might tend to use something like that where it's all a little bit greener. Uh, the same if you're getting into some some you know perhaps salt water stuff on some sandy areas you might go for the very light colours as well so um, try and blend in with your environment and uh, try don't try and move very quickly because that's going to alert the fish of your presence. Uh, sneak around a little bit and the fish won't know you're there until you've already hooked him. Now fly fishing is different to everyone. I think for me, what really excites me about fly fishing is, is being outside in some amazing places. And you, you literally, fly fishing gives you an excuse to go to some of these places. But to walk up a river or to, or to walk along a beach or over a sand flat or you know, even being in a boat and to, to, to see a fish you know, um, and target it, you know, where it could be with a fly you've tied or something you've just hand picked out and to do a good cast, you know, just in front of it, doesn't spook it, and, you know, to strip it properly, and, and to do this, to do that, to do everything right. I mean, fly fishing, you've got to have done 20 things right before you catch a fish. So every fish that you do actually hook up is, is such an achievement, you know? I mean, fish eat for a living, and we're throwing something that's uh, it's rubber or fur or, or metal and getting it to eat it, you know? And I think that's pretty cool. So to get that hook up, to me, that's what fly fishing's about. And uh, I think you've just got to also stop yourself every now and then and just have a look around because we really do go to some amazing places, you know. Out in the bush, we get to see things like animals and, and just the environment which you get to to go with fly fishing. I mean, that, that's why I do it. I, I just literally love it and I can't do enough of it, you know. So it's, it's something you'll, I, I dare say, as you go through your journey of fly fishing as well, you're going to get better and better and see more and appreciate things more too as, as well. So it's, um, yeah, it's, it's your first step in, in the right direction for the rest of your life. So, um, yeah, you're certainly going to love it. Um, yeah, it's just a magnificent thing and you'll be, uh, you'll be glad you started it. Now, I guess where else do you go to from here? You know, you, you may have... Um, watched a DVD and, uh, and, and, and what have you, and it's sort of a bit hard. Your next step is we also do courses as well, if that's something we can help you with, where we can certainly coach you in half a day and can put you on the right track, whether it be with casting and work on what we've taught you in this DVD, or teach you how to catch fish in, in some of the areas that we'll take you to. Um, we can get the repetition of, of the fish taking and hooking and striking and so that it comes naturally to you. The other option is we do a lot of uh, guided days too on, on the small rivers and, and perhaps even lakes in the area and can really um, get you going there. I guess in a lot of ways it's like having a golf pro um, with you for the day, playing a round of golf. And we can work on things and use your own techniques and just sort of fine tune them to make you the best fly fisher you can be. And that could be just in casting or just in your reactions on, on how to um, what to look for, how to hook up fish, how to play them. Uh, and it's always going to be ongoing. You're never going to be the absolute superstar that, that, that can't learn anymore. You'll always get fish that'll show you up. Uh, you'll always soon so learn something new from somebody else um, and you'll have a lot of fun doing it. You, know? um, you can do it by yourself, the same as you can play golf by yourself. But I think it's great fun to spend time with a, with a good friend on water that's amazing. And, uh, and we've all grown up throughout our fishing lives and, and no sooner have we caught the fish and we're running home to show mum what a super angler we are and we've caught this lovely big fish. And that's all well and good and we, we did that for years when we were kids. And there's nothing wrong with that either, you know, just belting the odd fish on the head and, and, and eating it, 
you know, is, is terrific. And uh, I, yeah, I love eating trout. Um, but there's also a time where we can catch that and put that back. And he'll go off and swim behind that same log or that same rock or that same body of water and, and somebody else will be able to catch him. So a lot of these trout can get caught over and over again. And uh, it certainly helps and take a lot of pressure off our, our fisheries if we are catching uh, some fish and putting them back in. We don't need to kill everything that we catch. You know, like those days are gone. We need to uh, probably look after our fisheries a lot better and it's up to us to do it. It's not up to the fisheries, you know, completely to um, make sure there's enough fish in every bit of water. We can do our own bit and that's by catching and putting it back in. Sure, get a photo, get it on a camera, film, you can do the whole lot. But uh, you put those ones back, particularly the big ones. You know, we all know that you're going to be a superstar angler. Once you get a photo of it, it's going to be fine. But put him back and let somebody else catch him too because he can get just as much enjoyment out of that fish as what you did then. Now, we do literally do trips all around the world. We do um, a lot, our specialties in New Zealand, which is the best fly fishing destination in the world. Uh, we do a lot of trips there, generally in... Uh, early season, sort of your October, November is a great time of, to go there. And then your February, March and April, they're outstanding fisheries. All sight fishing and that's the beauty of New Zealand because you can walk up a river and spot a four pounder and go, well this is pretty cool. You might muck up the cast or something but you know that take another ten steps and there's another four pounder or three pounder or whatever. Just got loads of fish and it's just so appealing um, because the water's so clear, you know, and the fish are so big. so. Uh, it's, it's an amazing experience that you've got to do at some stage in your life is go to New Zealand and target that. The same we've got down in Tassie. It's magnificent waterways uh, and I think they're just so beautiful down there. A lot of sight fishing, different to New Zealand, but still pretty good as well. You know, a lot of rising fish and a lot of solid fish as well. But we've also got some great areas, you know, throughout Victoria, you know, into New South Wales, Eucumbine, uh, and we get some outstanding fishing at times, you know, but we've got to... We've got to, I suppose, alter. Uh, if we're fishing Victoria, a lot of small fish in the smaller rivers. But all we've got to do is taper it down. We use a lighter little rod to fish the small rivers and you can have a lot of fun because you can literally catch a, a lot of fish. But then you've got other areas as well. You know, and you've got like um, Chile, you know, which is an amazing fishery and that's a real experience in itself. Alaska with all its bears. Uh, and, and moose and wolves and things like that. And it really is an untouched environment over there and the salmon fishing. And another one which I really love is um, Christmas Island and bone fishing. And bone fishing is just an amazing experience. And that, as a fly fisherman, down the track, but just keep it in the paddock, back of your mind, bone fishing is something you've just got to do. The fish are just incredible. It's an amazing place to go. We go to Christmas Island and it literally is the best bone fishing destination in the world. Uh, and there's, uh, it's an amazing place to go because you can target everything, you know, from tuna to giant trevally, sailfish, you know, wahoo. There's not a, th there's literally not a, f a fish swimming that we can't catch, you know, on a fly. So, um, yeah, keep your, your eyes and ears open for what you can uh, experience because there's so much of, of a world out there that fly fishing gives us that excuse to go and, and experience. So uh, you'll get a lot out of fly fishing you get a lot out of the, the people that you meet uh, and the experiences you get. Uh, it's just incredible, incredible. You'll absolutely love it. And um, yeah, there won't, there won't be a time you won't look back and go, I wish I had started this fly fishing caper later. You'll just continue to improve and just have a wonderful time. So uh, yeah, I hope you've enjoyed uh, a beginner's introduction. Um, there's a lot to fly fishing, but just take it in stages and just build up. So don't get in a panic that you're not a superstar straight away. Uh, you'll build it up as you go along and uh, yeah, you learn in your, at your own speed and you'll just enjoy it. But if there's any help you need or you've got a lot of questions that um, are really doing your head in, just give us a call you know, or drop into our store or, or, or send us an email. You know, there's plenty we can do to help because at the end of the day, we're all on the same team. We're all about teaching you to be a better fly fisher. So uh, if we can help that, we're here for you all the time. Yeah. So good fishing and I look forward to catching you on the fly.